Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm here today with uh, Alex Young. Um, Alex, can you introduce yourself to the audience? Uh, who are you? What do you do? And uh, what's your background? Hi, I'm, I'm a research scientist in the Department of Human Genetics at UCLA. So I originally studied mathematics and then uh, genomic medicine and statistics at the University of Oxford. So I do statistical genetics with a particular focus on educational and behavioral traits. Yeah. And so the behavioral genetics stuff, I mean, this started in, you know, the, the early research was sort of twin and adoption studies, right? I mean, you're, you're, you're in that tradition, right? And then they moved on to the, um, to the GWAS. So could you sort of just talk a little bit about the history of the field and where it is now? Yeah. So I guess the history of the field goes back to Sir Francis Galton in, in the 19th century, who termed regression and did a lot of these early sort of statistical analyses of, about how parents relate to offspring. And he actually wrote a book called Hereditary Genius, which was maybe the, the first kind of text to try and scientifically analyze why some people become eminent in various fields. And that kind of laid the foundation for these uh, approaches that basically look at how correlated different relatives are and from those correlations between relatives, they try and infer whether genetics is is explaining the differences between individuals or environment. And the, the, the key parameter that people estimate is called the heritability. And that is not, not exactly what Galton was doing, but he was laying the foundations for that. And twin studies developed in the 20th century to more formally estimate heritability, which is a fraction of variation in the population explained by genetic differences. So they look at the difference between identical twins and non-identical twins. And if identical twins are more similar than non-identical twins, then the twin studies claim that that is due to genetics and not environment because they basically share the same environment, the same family mm -hmm. environment. And that was all we had to go on really before large scale genome sequencing came on the scene. And that, that really came on the scene um, in you know, the 2000s. They started getting genetic data on sufficiently large samples of individuals, so thousands of individuals. And from that, you can try to find particular genetic variants that explain the heritability, or you can try and estimate how much is all of this genetic variation they were able to measure, how much of the variation in some phenotype like height or educational attainment is that explaining? Yeah. And so the her hereditary, hereditary genius, I mean, that, that didn't uh, Galton, he had like a um, adoption method. Didn't he, didn't he look at the, um, I read this, but it was so long ago. Didn't he look at like the, um, uh, uh, the adopted children of popes? Am I remembering that right? Um, <laughs> you might be, I, I'm, I'm not sure actually if he looked at the adopted children of popes, but it sounds, sounds like something you might've done. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I'm misremembering this and this was some other early, uh, early person in the field but uh, but yeah uh, i think i think he might have done something like that um and he talked about twins too and then the um and so like it's amazing because it's such simple algebra right it's just the fact that um uh the twice as many genes are shared in common uh between identical twins compared to uh fraternal twins right and with just some basic algebra you can get heritability estimates right yeah, yeah, it's a very elegant idea to separate our genetics from environment. I'm not sure it's necessarily perfect. It can, it can potentially be biased. It, it relies on an assumption called the equal environments assumption. So the, the key assumption is that the environmental similarity of identical twins is the same as non-identical twins. And that there might be some bias in twin studies. That's some of the research that, that I did when I was working at Decode and, and living in Iceland. But uh, in the in the broad scale, they're they're giving us a good sense of how important genetics is versus other factors in explaining variation. So your research was on the bias in the in the twin studies. What did what did you uh, what what did you find? Well, like because the um, I know about there were some studies of people's doppelgangers. Didn't people look for people who looked alike and see if they turned out personality wise the same? Are you familiar with this research? And they turned. I think it was in Judith Rich Harris's nurture assumption. And it turned out they did it, which indicated that maybe maybe there, there wasn't a bias here. Yes, I am familiar with that. I mean, I guess it's one of those tricky things where uh, 
it's, a, it's an assumption that's very hard to test in the actual scenario under which it it is occurring because twins are kind of a special case, right? Like when people know that two people are identical twins, that's kind of different than them just looking similar. They're like from the same family and they interact with each other and they probably affect each other. So my my research when I was working at Decode in, in Iceland, it wasn't I was I didn't set out to try and prove that twin studies were, were biased. I was just trying to use the, the genomic data to estimate heritability, to estimate this fraction of the, the phenotypic variation that's due to genetics in, in a way that was potentially more robust than, than any other method. So that was my goal. And, and, and the results turned out to, to indicate less heritability for height and for educational attainment than twin studies. Um, I think the jury is still out whether whether I'm correct or the or the twin estimates are correct. But what was your uh, method? Can you describe the method exactly? So, in the method is it's a little bit complicated to explain. So it's it's almost easy to explain the the method that I I was generalizing. So the method that I was generalizing, what it does is it it looks just within siblings. So this yeah. was a method developed quite a while ago, back in two thousand and six. And what it does is it looks at the variation in relatedness among siblings. So yeah. we imagine siblings are related to a certain degree on average because they share the same parents. But during the, the production of sperm and eggs during meiosis, yeah. there's this randomization of genetic material that takes place. So siblings actually vary in how related they are. Some are varied at like, uh, some are related at like 0.4, some are related at 0.6. And this variation in relatedness is due to just random segregations of genetic material during the production of sperm and eggs. And these are like coin tosses. So mm. this is like a natural, it's a natural experiment you can exploit to infer genetic causation as opposed to environment. So by looking at whether siblings that happen to be more related yeah. are more phenotypically similar, so say closer in their height or their IQ, and siblings that are less being less genetically related you can estimate heritability in a way that is potentially more robust than the twin estimates it, it doesn't have this assumption that, that we can never really be sure about about whether mm -hmm. twins interact and influence each other and that kind of like create some kind of bias yeah that's 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 fascinating and when well i don't know my my intuition just my statistical intuition is if you have what are what are these LLs that there are millions that are potentially you could differ on? Shouldn't the law of large numbers shouldn't be? Would you really get sixty percent or forty percent? Shouldn't shouldn't it be really close to fifty all the time? So if the genome was of infinite length and there was and each bit of DNA was like if it was like all independent coin tosses and you had like a million different independent coin yeah. tosses, then yes, your your statistical intuition about the law of large numbers is correct, and there'd be essentially zero variation. But the genome is of finite length, and and the, and the segments are not independently inherited. I so see. the effect, the effective number of independent segments, it when 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 a parent produces a sperm or an egg, in terms of which bits are being inherited together or or not, it's it's much lower than than you might think. So the variation among siblings is actually quite substantial. So I think the standard deviation is like 0.035 or something. Wow. So, so so it's so it's quite easy for a sibling pair to be 0.4 related or 0.6 related and if you have a large family you could even do that as a fun yeah. exercise you could all calculate your relatedness and see which uh, sibling you're most similar to genetically yeah. and whether That's that tracks your ph phenotypic and personality traits mm. or something. <laughs> yeah, so it's so it's through uh, three point five, you say percent is the standard deviation. So ninety five percentile would be something like uh, seven percent each way. So you'd have yeah, like sixty to sixty to forty, basically. Right? Wow, that's that's interesting. That that is really fascinating. And the idea is that if they're if like the sixty percent siblings should be a lot more alike than the forty percent siblings on IQ or or height or or whatever, right? Well, they should. Yeah, the the how much more alike they are based on their relatedness should exactly track the the heritability essentially. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, so you're just, say, and you're saying you get lower, you get lower heritability. How much lower on things like IQ and, and height? So the method that I developed is actually a generalization of that to all possible relative pairs. So like, it's it's probably more technical than we want to get into. But the problem with the sibling thing is 
uh, you need like hundreds of thousands of SIBs to get any kind of a precise estimate. So I developed a way of generalizing this that gives you a lot more power. And um, that would give you an estimate for height of around 55% as opposed to twin studies, which often give you an estimate around 80%. So there is a substantial difference, but you know, not everyone agrees that my method is the, is the one that you should believe and the twin study is the ones you shouldn't believe. It yeah. might be the truth. The truth is probably somewhere in the middle, I would guess. Yeah. Yeah. Although the, I mean, it could be the, the, the identical twins, you, you would get any interaction effect in the genome, right? Which you wouldn't get just from slightly more similarity. So by interaction effect, you mean so genetic inter Yeah, exactly. So there's these two genes, yeah. and if you have both of them, they add you know, beyond what each one adds individually. And you would, you would not find that necessarily. You would be less likely to find that, I would think, in the, in the sibling stu the studies, wouldn't you? So the, yeah, the, the bias from, I mean, it, again, it, you have to be a bit careful about what parameter you're talking about here, because... There's the total heritability, which includes all kinds of genetic effects, whether it's like these more complicated interactions between different parts of the genome. And commonly what we're trying to estimate, though, is not that broad sense heritability, what we call broad sense heritability that captures all genetic effects. It's like a narrow version of that. That's just what we can explain with a linear model. So like if we add up the effects of all the yeah. different variants. So the, the sibling version actually will, will give you an estimate of something very close to the full genetic component, including interactions. The twin one will actually overestimate even the broad one. So the twin one can be an overestimate of even the broad sense of heritability when you have genetic interactions. There's not actually a huge amount of evidence for genetic interactions statistically playing playing an important role, though. So. Right. It might it might explain a little bit of what's going on here, but my guess is it won't explain all of it. Yeah, and it's fascinating. I mean, I would have thought just my intuition like would have been that interaction of genes would have been very important. I think people. I think I've seen the same Nicholas Taleb who hates like IQ research and genetic research, and I think he says like, "Oh, there's too many possible interactions." But it seems like nature didn't work out that way. I mean, isn't it, it, does that seem strange to you? Just like from an intuition, and do you have like a theory as to why sort of it would be like that? <laughs> Well, this this becomes almost a philosophical discussion about what an interaction is, because I think the mm. the common sense notion of an interaction is like a mechanistic one. And so you have these two things like hitting into each other and like that's an interaction. But statistical interaction is actually not the same as that. Mm. So statistical interaction is more like saying there's something that we can't explain with a linear model just by adding up the separate effects of things. But actually what you can have is that mechanistically there can be a lot of interactions, but you can still explain most of the variation with a linear model. So the fact that statistically we don't need to invoke interactions to explain genetic variation doesn't mean that the underlying biology isn't actually having these mechanistic interactions yeah. going on. It's just that we can explain almost all of the variation with a linear model. Mm. And is, is that saying that maybe a lot of these interactions, maybe they sort of cancel out? Is, is that sort of, is sort of is, could that be part of a reason why? Well, it's more that even if your function is not a purely linear function, you can often approximate it pretty well with a linear function, right? Yeah. It's like you have, you have like a curve, but you can draw a line through it and you can capture most of that. That's a decent yeah. approximation it's, it's to good, most it's curves. It's good enough, right. Yeah, yeah. And, and actually in... In human genetics, one of the, in, especially in humans, a lot of the genetic variations that affect a phenotype are rare in the population. So in that case, we only ever see the difference between, or, or most commonly, we only see the difference between naught and one copies of a particular allele, which you can draw a line. You can always draw a line to explain that when something is rare. You can capture almost all of its effect um, in the population statistically, even if the underlying biological model is nonlinear. Yeah. So okay. So yeah. So that's you know that's another uh, that's another twin a twin method. Is the, is there a, the or a sibling method? Uh, and so can you just talk a little bit about the 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 GWAS? I mean, I think we I think we've uh, I think we've sort of skipped over that get, to get to the uh, the sibling stuff. But can you just sort of explain that for the for people who are not familiar? Yeah. So what we were talking about is trying to estimate heritability, which is like the overall importance of genetic effects in explaining variation in some phenotype. But 
what we might want to do is actually pinpoint specific variations in the genome that have an effect on a phenotype like height or educational attainment. And the most common way to do that is a study design called a genome-wide association study. So basically what that does is it scans across potentially millions of different genetic vari variants across the genome, and it tries to estimate what the effect of changing from one version of that genetic variant to another is at each position in the genome. And by doing that, we can look at particular sites, variable sites in, in the genome that we have strong evidence for having an effect on the phenotype. And we can, we can actually build genetic predictors, often called polygenic scores, to predict the phenotype from the genotype. So that's something that has been done a lot in biomedical genetics, but also in, in my own research in, for phenotypes like educational attainment. Yeah. And is it basically, is the underlying statistics just a, just a regression, uh, just a OLS regression, but with like a, a really big sample size and a lot of variables thrown in? Well, there are different ways of doing it, but the simplest version is basically just like an OLS regression. You're just regressing the phenotype onto the number of copies of a particular genetic variant someone, someone carries, but there are more sophisticated versions that try and control for potential confounding factors, but... Uh, as a basic kind of way to think about it, you can think of it like an OLS regression. Yeah, uh -huh, uh -huh. that's a, that's interesting. And, and the uh, the the idea is that the, this has not come close to sort of matching the twin and adoption studies, right? And as far as heritability explained, we've there's a lot of missing heritability, which you've written about, right? Yes. So this became a hot topic uh, in the early days of genome-wide association studies. People were very optimistic about collecting a few thousand samples, we'd identify all of the genes, all of genetic variants, we'd be able to build this model that explains the heritability as estimated from twin studies. And it hasn't really turned out like that. And especially in the early days, we could only identify a few genetic variants with very strong effects. And they explain just like for height, they would explain like a few percent of the variation in height, whereas the twin studies were suggesting that the heritability was like 80%. So there's this huge gap in what we could explain and what we thought we should be able to explain. And there's still a bit of an issue with that, but we're sort of closing the gap more and more. So for height, for example, there was a paper published in Nature, I believe, this year with using 5 million samples. And they can explain like 45 to 50% of the, the, the variation in height. Mm -hmm. Using, using all of the genetic variants that they've identified in European ancestry samples, at least. So the gap between that and the twin estimate is still there, but it's, it's a lot smaller than it was when people started worrying about this in the early days of uh, genome-wide association studies. But uh, yeah, I guess it's, uh, hope, the hope now is that we can use whole genome sequencing data to further close that gap. So yeah, that's... That's that's helping us to interrogate the very rare genetic variants in the population. Like yeah. most of the most of the studies done to date, they only interrogate genetic variants that are present at a minimum frequency of like one percent or something. Yeah. And it, and it might actually be in part because of selection that a lot of the variants with large effects on the phenotype and a lot of the heritability for a phenotype like height. It's actually due to genetic variants that have been kept at low frequency by by mm. selection. Yeah, so and we, wasn't, we, wasn't, we need... wasn't this the the idea behind Steve Shu's uh, Genius Bank? He was trying to get like people with really high IQs, like one thirty or something, and he was trying to see what they had in common. That's sort of the idea, right? Like maybe those people would have the super rare variants. Yeah, I mean, I think I saw something uh, about that a while back that that he would sort of measure the genetic distance between people on the extremes of the phenotype distribution. Um, I don't know if he never, he never got funding for that, I guess, but, um, uh, it was, it's yeah. a long story. He was like, he was on the podcast. It was some <laughs> kind of, it was some kind of partnership with the Chinese government. It got very confusing and, uh, yeah, it, 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 ended, up, it uh, ended up not working out. Unfortunately, they, they, you know, they, they, like the company went in like a different direction because of some, I think some kind of government reason. Um, so yeah, yeah. But, 
but that's but that would be the idea that would be the the idea sound right like if somebody you know if you're looking for sort of if you think there's a few you know there might be something that like einstein had and newton happened to have had somebody else happened to have and you know that that just might be out there for us to discover right there's not a lot of samples of 140 or 150 iq people out there right yeah well i think it's it's probably quite difficult to get funding for for a study that explicitly designs uh <laughs> itself to find super high IQ people. I mean, I, I think that most of the, the studies looking at these kind of phenotypes have sort of piggybacked onto biobanks that have been set up for medical epidemiology. So there are people now, and actually in the pharma industry, looking to identify genes that when you essentially break them, if you have a genetic variant that like breaks a, a copy of this gene, it has an impact on your your education or your intelligence. So there's a a preprint from Biogen, I think, which is like a big pharma biotech company, uh, doing this. So there's actually some interest from pharma because I think they're interested in identifying genes that disrupt cognitive processes because they're interested in developing drugs for Alzheimer's. Is, so you're saying they do test they do tests on animals where they they is is that what you're saying? No, this is in uh, using the UK biobank data. So using uh, oh. data on like half a million people sampled in, in the UK, they can now interrogate these rare genetic variations that break uh, you said, the function you said of, far, of, of a protein. I thought you said, yeah, I, I, thought, I thought you said farmers. <laughs> I thought you said farmers. Are doing oh, this no. <laughs> uh, no, 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 not that kind. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, the, yeah, so that's, yeah, this is, yeah, this is all this is all just i mean this is all just fascinating are you confident that like you know so there's people who are doing uh poly you know there, there's polygenic scores you can get um theoretically there's you know there, it's just all the it's all just bigger sample sizes right if the heredity if the heritability is out there you know we have the tools it's just the sample sizes need to be big enough is, is, that, is that the idea yeah, so I I was one of the the lead authors on a on the largest genetic association study of educational attainment done to date. So that was using three million samples, and we actually only gained a little bit of predictive power over the previous study, which was on a million samples. So there is there is sort of a law of diminishing returns here. So we can now predict around twelve to seventeen percent of the the variation in, in how many years of school you get from from your genotype using this predictor constructed from like 3 million samples. But um, yeah, it's it, it was, it's going to take way, way bigger samples to substantially improve that, I, I think. So yeah. we are at a point where I, I think either the scale needs to get way larger or we need to actually change the study design into to interrogate the, the rarer variants that, that have been ignored in a lot of previous studies, which is what I was saying before with some of the pharma companies are doing that now. But um, yeah, that's it, it's a question of whether the heritability is explained by the common genetic vari variants mainly, or it's explained by the rare variants. So if it's, if it's explained by the rare variants, then the, the statistical methods and the type of data that you need are, are a bit different. So it's not, it's not simply a question of increasing sample size. It's also a question of improving the, the data quality. Yeah. I mean, I'm fascinated. There's like a whole, I'm fascinated by the possibility that there's like a holy grail out there. Like, there's just one gene that might add like 15 IQ points. Like, is that the idea? Like, maybe not that much, but there's just like something out there that could be just like sort of doing a lot that is just too rare for us to see. Uh, so you're talking about a gene that that when disrupted it might actually improve your your cognitive ability or something some sort of well either 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 way i mean it, 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 it's the idea that there's just these very rare things that could be out there but we just they're just too rare for us to to find is that sort of is that what you're saying that whether it's that or the common uh, uh so you, so yeah yeah that that's we already know some of those genes and in fact some of the genes that that they were identified by studying people with severe sort of Mendelian genetic disorders that cause uh, cognitive development issues, they, they can also be seen in the general population in, in, in the UK that if you have a particular variant that, that messes up the function of this gene, it can say reduce your, your IQ by like a whole standard deviation, like 15 points or something. But there are people just walking, walking around like they, they're not necessarily identified as having a Mendelian disease some of them probably are that, that carry these variants. So these these large effect variants do 
sort of segregate, as we say, technically in, in the general population. They're not, not just restricted to sort of Mendelian clinical cases. Yeah. Uh, the, the interesting question is, is there a gene that when you disrupt it, increases your cognitive ability vastly? That would be something yeah. that you could potentially target a drug towards, which is an idea yeah. I've, I've always found it found interesting, but I'm, I'm not sure um, yeah. how you'd ever get that get that approved by the FDA, but... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that, that's right. The um, uh, so the uh, you also have a you also have a um, uh, a sibling method w w with with using the GWAS, right? You 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 are there is a way to look for that, right? You've written about that. So you're talking about using family data for doing G GWAS? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you could, the, because I think the oh, I, rem I remember the paper now. The paper basically said because there's there's segmentation in the population, right? So this is just the problem with GWAS generally that like you know something could segregate in the upper class or the lower class, and then mm. siblings is a way to get around that, right? Yeah. So there is confounding issues in in the studies that have been done on phenotypes like education and that um you know that this genetic variant you identify as having an effect on ea or you estimate it has an effect on ea part of that effect might be driven by the correlation of that genetic variant with some environmental factors that increase educational attainment there's also um a very interesting phenomenon a sort of mating so people with high levels of education tend to have children with other people with similarly high levels of education. And that generates all sorts of statistical issues in, in analyzing genetic data. And in fact, um, like Gregory Clark, um, I don't know if you're familiar with his work, but mm -hmm. he's documented this going back to like 1600 in, in England that people have a very high correlation of their social status so that the very genetic structure of the population is kind of related to all of this education related mating that and, and social status related mating that's been going on for hundreds of years so that creates a lot of statistical uh, issues for the standard way of doing a genetic association study and like i was talking about the heritability estimation before nature has provided us with this natural experiment this randomization of genetic material when you inherit it from your mother or your father so you can also exploit that when trying to estimate the effect of a genetic variant on a phenotype. And I think that's um, the kind of just the study design that you do in an ideal world. If you had, if you, if you were in an ideal world where you had a huge amount of data and you had genetic data on everyone's parents as well, that's the kind of study you would do because then you would get an unbiased estimate of the causal effect of the, of the genetic variant. And that might actually help you improve your genetic prediction methods as well because you're getting the causal estimate. Yeah. So you talked about biobanks. You know, there's uh, these these uh, these commercial companies, these like 23andMe. You know, often they have me take uh, surveys like, you know, do you like to eat peanuts? Can you smell this or can you do that? Or do you have that, this? So they're apparently doing the research. So that seems like that would be, that would be, that's a, that must be a huge database. Um, are they just keeping it in-house? Can people get any access to that? Are those commercial, uh, uh, is that commercial, commercially collected data? Is that available any, anywhere? Uh, well, yeah, so the education genetic study that, that I was one of the author, main authors on that was published this year, that was mainly using 23andMe data. So I think I'm actually in my own study because I did 23andMe and I answered oh, the education, so I'm in that education did, question. Did, did, you have every, ever, did you have everyone that they uh, sequenced or, or a portion or what? Well, it's people that have consented for research and then there's some sort of ancestry filtering yeah. as well. So. Uh, depending on whether you fall in the European uh, genetic cluster or not, then then yeah, you would be be in it. Or was that, not, was that hard to get? What, what what do they want? What do they want out of it? Do you do, do they make you pay an access fee? What what do they get? Anyone can apply for it for an academic research collaboration. I think they have their own internal reasons for which ones they choose to to collaborate on and which ones they don't. That that I. I don't have a lot of insight into. Yeah. I, I, think I think they get remember. way they get way more requests than they can uh, yeah. actually partake in. Yeah, I think I think I remember reading that they do have some. Uh, they, you know, they give you all this information like, oh, you're you know, you are prone to blood clots, or you're prone to this, or you're not prone to that. Um, 
I heard that they have the data. They can, you know, they basically have a polygenic score for you or the equivalent. Um, they can say, uh, but they just don't do it because they think it would be bad PR. Have, have you seen this? That they don't want to. They don't want to tell people. You know, you're not. You're genetically, you know, not very smart. Yeah, I mean, I I guess it's also that they got in trouble in the early days from the FDA when they were giving a, a lot more sort of medically relevant information, and then the FDA was like, "Oh no, you can't do that." So oh well, I think, well, that stuff I, that stuff is there. I mean, that stuff is there. I don't know if you've gone to your profile, it, but like, it, it doesn't tell you to take this drug or that, but it really it goes into some detail. Like, but I I think I think they're pretty cautious about what they they give back to to the customers in, in part because of you know, what happened previously with the FDA, although, you know, I, I don't know what, what, what their internal decision process is, but they could give you a lot more information than they do, though, you're right. Yeah. The um, So the idea, I mean, some people, you know, they, they talk about um, uh, comparing across ethnicities or, or that, and, uh, you know, the standard line I hear people say is that it doesn't, um, it doesn't translate, like you can't use the predictors from one population to another. That's That strikes me as odd because it seems like, you know, it seems like the you know we're we're the same species. It seems like if there's this gene that adds an IQ point in whites, like why wouldn't it in Asians or or Middle Easterners or, or whatever? I mean, what do what do you think about that whole debate? Yeah, so you can obviously use these predictors that are generally derived from European ancestry samples. You can use them in other ancestries, and they they do predict the phenotype. <laughs> the big question at the minute is why do they have lower levels of prediction? So if you, if you use a predictor trained on European ancestry data and you try and predict, say, height in African ancestry or East Asian ancestry individuals, then you're going to get a, a less good prediction. Mm. And you'll, you'll get something, though. What's, what's the magnitude of sort of a loss in, in predictability? So the, the loss in predictive ability basically falls off linearly with the genetic distance mm. for most phenotypes, at least. So I think in East Asians, if you train something in Europeans and you predict in East Asians, it's around half as predictive. Mm. And I think in African ancestry individuals, it's around one quarter. Mm. That's, so, that's still interesting, though. So maybe you're maybe you're, go you're 10 years behind in predicting East Asians because of the... Uh, uh, you know, with the European data, but it's still interesting. I mean, that's not completely useless, right? No, it's certainly not completely useless. And people are developing methods to improve the the what people call transferability. And you're right that the, the underlying biology is is probably in most cases very similar, but we don't actually identify in most cases the causal variants. So there. Are, technical issues with the way that we do these studies that we can't necessarily identify a particular position in the genome as being that's the causal one. We can identify a particular region and within that region, all the genetic variants are highly correlated. So there's this, this statistical problem of identifying the causal variant. And those correlations, actually, the statistical correlations between nearby variants in the genome, they vary across populations due to the different population histories. So that's an in part why why these predictors don't translate well across ancestry. And also genetic drift means that we expect allele frequencies to be different yeah. across the genome and different ancestries. So we learn about something that's common, a genetic variant. We learn a lot about a genetic variant that's common and we have a lot of variation in Europeans, but that variant might be at a lower frequency in another ancestry. So it's not it's not helping the prediction very well. And some other variant that that is causative could be at a higher intermediate frequency in a different ancestry, but at a low uh, low frequency in European ancestry samples. So we don't have much information on it. Um, so yeah, it's it's a tractable problem though. I mean, the main solution to it is just collecting more diverse data, mm -hmm. which there is a big push to do that at the minute in, in genomics. Mm -hmm. Why 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 aren't, um, it's, so why, why haven't East Asia, I mean, the most developed region of the world outside the West is East Asia. I mean, is the science, they're pretty good at scientific stuff. So what, what, is the, why is the science so behind? Shouldn't they, shouldn't they be sort of doing the same things we're doing? I mean, they are, and, and East Asian samples are, are the next biggest after European. So the, there's a Japanese biobank, there's a China Kaduri biobank, there's goals in China to, to generate way more data. So I think it's not going to be long before they 
probably actually surpass the European ancestry samples in, in part just because the population is so much larger. And if China really put its mind yeah. to it and, and, and invested heavily in it, then they could have by far the biggest data set in the world, right? So yeah. I, I think that they are catching up pretty pretty quickly. Yeah. Is your impression, I've heard contradictory things about whether it's easier or more difficult to do that research within China. Uh, do you have any any, any in, information uh, about that? So I actually nearly took a job in China uh, a few years ago. I, I, I nearly took a job at the Beijing Genomics Institute. Uh, so I got to visit the China National Gene Bank in Shenzhen. And I, I didn't really discuss anything about studying cognitive ability. I mean, I guess Steve... Sue was he was um, looking into doing it in China, so I guess maybe yeah. there was some some level of receptiveness to, to yeah. what he wanted to do there. But I I, wasn't thinking I don't know if I have enough insight yeah. into that. I mean, I think in general they they they're into doing genetic studies, but I'm not sure about cognitive ability specifically. Yeah. Well, I've I've heard they have actually some difficult, like they have actual people wouldn't think so, but like some kind of strict policy. I mean, uh, privacy restrictions in China just on using people's data. I don't know how you know. I don't know much about this, but I've I've heard some things about that. I know it's very difficult to use Chinese data if you're not in China. Mm -hmm. uh, you need you need to have collaborators within China who who are working with you. Essentially, it's it's it's. It's not something that is going to be shared with the rest of the world, probably that all of this Chinese data. Yeah, yeah. So they'll have the models to predict. You know, they're they're. You know, yeah, I see. But they probably will. We we might not have access to it. Are you? Uh, yeah. So this, I mean, this research is not you know popular throughout academia. Particularly, you've mentioned the difficulties of uh, studying cognitive ability. I mean, how how you know what are some of the barriers? I mean, there was a recent article by James Lee in City Journal. Uh, on this topic, I mean, like, what generally, what what do researchers face when they're when they're trying to do this stuff that other people in the field are not? Yeah, well, I I do think the the environment has become more hostile to this kind of research, especially in the U.S. in recent years, and I think some people seem to want to frame any kind of research on the genetics of education as potentially harmful, potentially dangerous something that we need to either not do or to be very, very careful. And I mean, we should be careful when we study it and we should be careful when we communicate it. But I think that there's, there's definitely a movement within the scientific institutions in the US to, if not ban this research, but to, to erect ever more barriers to it. And even within, you know, scientific publishers, for example, like there was this editorial recently in Nature Human Behavior, they got quite a lot of blowback because it basically said that we can decide to retract even, not even not publish, but retract after the fact studies that they deem to somehow cause indirect harms through so-called stigmatization. I can actually read to you the one of the criteria by which your study could get retracted and see if you can uh, make sense yeah. of this. It says submissions that embody singular privileged perspectives, which are exclusionary of a diversity of voices in relation to socially constructed or socially relevant human groupings in which purport such perspectives to be generalizable and or assumed. Yeah. And I, 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 I don't know if you can make any more sense of that than me, but no, this editorial based yeah, it basically said that if at some point in the future after your study is published, one of the editors deems that this criterion has been breached, they can retract your paper. And it's very hard to know whether any kind of behavior genetics research, which often is not liked by certain crowds within academia and on, on Twitter and whatever, like, yeah. Whether whether that that is going to be applied yeah. retrospectively? Yeah, I mean, there's been a uh, woke, a you know, great awakening in, in the journals, particularly in scientific journals. I think it's been really noticeable since 2020, although it's been uh, going on for a while. Uh, do you have hope? I mean, like a lot of this stuff seems like it can be done and is getting done in the in the private sector. I mean, is 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 sort of is that like if you're a young researcher, maybe you should just go work for 23andMe. Um, or something like that. I mean, what do you, what do you think about that? 
Well, uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of young researchers are going to work for industry in the field of genomics anyway, in part just because there's a huge, huge amount of investment and, and generally better salaries in, in industry than in academia. So that's that's one issue we're facing as, as a field, that it's hard to actually compete with industry to recruit like postdocs and things like that. So even independent of all the uh, political issues, I, I think a lot of people are going to go and work in industry anyway. Um, I... I think that if I was talking to to a young person who is thinking about doing <laughs> studies on the genetics of education and intelligence, I would probably just say, well, you know, it's going to make your life more difficult than if you decide to study just straight biomedical phenotypes. I mean, I I didn't even start off in this field. I, I was doing more straight biomedical genomics, statistical genetics. I got into sort of social science genetics by accident. And maybe I was a little naive. I didn't really know what I was uh, at the hornet's nest that I was sort of wandering into. <laughs> um, but yeah, the the direction of travel for the culture of science is is not it's not looking good for this this area of research, at least in the U.S. So I think Europe is a little bit more robust on on this. Like the UK biobank data, you can get the data on educational attainment and they, they gave people a fluid intelligence test so you can you can access that data pretty easily even in, in, in the US. Whether that's going to be the true going forward, I don't know, but I think the climate is less hostile in the UK and in Europe to, to studying intelligence and cognitive ability and education and, and genetics of, of them. Yeah. There's there's phenotypes so I, I think that it's likely to move away from the U.S. a bit if the, the climate continues getting more and more hostile. And the Scandinavian countries are pretty are pretty open with this stuff too, aren't they? Yeah, so this, I mean, I, I worked in, in um, Iceland for this company Decode after I finished my PhD, and they, they were pretty open to studying these things. That's how I kind of accidentally stumbled into social science genetics because uh, – some of the data there that they had ended up being really powerful for for understanding, you know, how how genetics contributes to, to variation in education. So I think they're fairly robust on this, and they have amazing data for it too. Because I think often, uh, at least for men, they 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 all take an IQ test essentially when they they um, are conscripted into the the military service, and they have. Um, school grades and standardized test scores available for everyone connected to the population registry like the way it works in iceland is it's like your social security number basically all of your records your tax records your school records everything is connected to that one number and and researchers can potentially access it although i think it's not it's not always trivial and there are a lot of privacy protections but in, in theory it would be a very powerful resource yeah. for studying this well, iceland, stuff. iceland i mean the population i mean is not that large so but it sounds like in sweden and norway if they're testing every single man and then they that data is available and you can you can use it right that, those must be the best are those the best available studies are they nordic data on the uh, heritability of intelligence um Probably, yes. I'm, I'm not sure if they're the best, but they're, they're definitely some of the best studies I've seen. Twin studies have come from like Sweden or, or Norway, yeah. And how much, um, how much can we get IQ? How much, like the, how much can we explain now just from the genome? genome? Well, that's, that's, I think, one of the, the issues is we've been studying educational attainment, right? Which is probably not the phenotype you'd want to study in, in an ideal world. It's, it's yeah. this kind of pretty rough measure of did a lot of the variation is basically like did you graduate high school did you go to college did you get an advanced degree um and that's a very rough measure of of, of these things that it, it, it's correlated with cognitive ability but not super highly correlated mm. so i think the the prediction for like cognitive ability from the scores derived from educational attainment is only around eight eight or nine percent i think depending on which data set you look in um we could do much better if we collected a lot of data on cognitive ability where we have the genetics measured and and an iq score or even just like sats or something like that something that isn't as environmentally influenced and sort of noisy a measure as how many years of schooling did you complete? Did you say that Scandinavian countries do do that when they in their military, or some Scandinavian countries do that? 
Well, they have the data. Um, yeah. They have the IQ test data somewhere. And there's a lot of genetic data also somewhere in a lot of these Scandinavian countries. I don't know if it's of the scale of something like 23. I mean, for example, the educational attainment study we did is like 3 million people, right? If you mm -hmm. wanted to really create a great genetic predictor of cognitive ability, you'd want to get 3 million people with, with IQ scores or with SAT scores or something like that. And I, I, I don't think that the Scandinavian countries have genetic data of that scale yet. They have some really amazing data sets, but not not of that scale. Why doesn't Why doesn't Twenty Three and Me just give a Raven's um, matrix to to people and use that? You'd have You'd have to ask them that. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, it'd be pretty easy. I, uh, I think that you know, there's there's definitely potential for those kind of things. It's 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 more a question of will and funding than it is of the the underlying science. I think if there was sufficient will and sufficient funding, it would be pretty easy to create a, a way more powerful genetic predictor of cognitive ability than we have currently. Yeah. And so when they, when they when they complain about this, they say this is stigmatizing and they you know they ask what is the what is the good of this research? Uh, you know, what's your response to that? Well, I think the stigmatization is a very subjective category. And I'm not sure that bureaucrats or whoever these custodians of data or or scientific publishers should should have this sort of very subjective criterion yeah. by which to decide what we can and can't study. I mean, the first question should be, is it good science? And that that should be the, the main the main criterion that we're judging things on. Like, is it true? So then there's the question of what's the value of it? So there are various answers I could give to that. I think if I was talking to biomedical researchers, I would say, you can't really ignore it. You can't ignore the contribution of education and intelligence to health. And this isn't some sort of like right wing pseudoscience talking point, right? Like, you see it all the time in the medical epidemiology literature that there's this sort of health education gradient that more educated people live longer, they're healthier, etc. And if genetics influences how intelligent people are and how much education they get, and that influences health, then that's a pathway that you should try and understand if you want to understand something like health inequalities. It's an important pathway. And there are all sorts of behavioral traits that affect your health, like whether you smoke, how much you drink, um, psychiatric conditions. All of these are related to studying behavior genetics there's even a but question you, you of whether, you whether know the, anything about the genome. You, you can give, you could just look at someone's education, or you could look at their, uh, you know, you could look at their SAT score or something, and you have that measure, and then you could say, oh, well, this person's prone to obesity or smoking or whatever, whatever the correlation is, right? I, I think the question, the question would be, what, what do you get out of the uh, knowing heritability estimates, and then knowing the specific genes? Right, but if you want to understand what the causes of these things are then you yeah. should be aware of that as a potential yeah. pathway exactly, and people yeah. are people are trying to use these genetic predictors of things like heart disease in the clinic and it's probably true that some of the genetic signal that they're using to predict heart disease is actually going through that pathway it's going through the cognitive intelligence related pathway it might not be a big component of the genetic risk for heart disease but it is yeah. a non-zero component and we see that with the uh, genetic predictive educational attainment we constructed, it actually has non-trivial predictive power for a whole host of diseases. So you can actually predict your disease risk using this genetic predictor of educational attainment. Exactly why, I guess we don't know, but these medical outcomes and cognitive and behavioral outcomes are not independent in the shared genetic effects between them. So I think you, you, you have to study humans in their totality you can't just wall off this very important factor that determines yeah. so much of life outcomes right both health yeah. and social outcomes yeah i mean it's it's yeah it's the fact that i i mean it's sort of it's like it's sort of a uh, conundrum for these people who want to sort of censor or ban this research and then that, that like it they, you know they say it's stigmatizing i mean but because it's actually really important like it influences like so much. And I think people sort of sense that and like, you know, 
everything could be stigmatizing, like obesity. I mean, crime. does anyone study? Do they even try to study crime? I, I imagine that's also another one where people just don't want to don't want to touch it. Are there GWAS? Yeah, I mean, GWAS studies for crime. Th- there are twin studies for for right. sort of antisocial behavior and violent or aggressive behavior, and they obviously show some heritability. But I, I don't know if anyone's done a GWAS of criminality. I mean, for one, it's it's actually very hard to get that kind of data and um, to get a sufficient sample size. I mean, yeah. I mean it's poss- it's possible to do it, but um, yeah. I haven't seen I haven't seen it done, or at least not done credibly yet. Yeah. There's also, I mean, there's also the the sort of the you know these the people if people want to have smart policy, I mean, just get away from the you know the uh, the um, health outcomes. I, even if you like want to have an education policy, you want to know how much is genetic and how much is, is environment, right? I mean, if environment is 100 percent of things, then you see a gap between uh, people from uh, one uh, one socioeconomic status and another. You say, oh, the education system is you know doing something wrong if everything's environmental. If Genetics play a huge role. Um, then maybe maybe there's no problem when you see you know this gap between a high socioeconomic and low socioeconomic. So, you know, to not want to know is just like you just want no way to evaluate policy, right? Isn't that in effect with what these people are saying? Yeah, I mean, I I think if you want to design smart policies, let's say your your main interest is solving educational inequalities. To me, it would seem rational to first understand what the causes of educational inequalities are. And yeah. excluding a whole a whole category of causes a priori for ideological reasons is not actually a rational way to study something and design good policies. I'm not saying that it's easy to derive the correct policy from a heritability estimate. I think that's a mistake. But you should at least have some awareness of, of genetics and the role it might be playing if you want to design a policy. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, yeah, I think that's right. I and mean, you said you know if you're worried about educational inequality, it's also the question of, you know, whether it's even possible. Like worried about educational inequality, like are we worried that there's a height difference between men and women? No, we're not because we realize that that's a genetic difference, right? It's like you know, it do- makes no, it doesn't. It's not even coherent to worry about things that can't be solved. And you want to know the, you want to know, you know, maybe it could be solved in part, and maybe not. But you need to know the extent to which these gaps can be solved before you even say i'm concerned about it because the part that you can't solve like there's no there's no point you're not a better person for worrying about that if there's nothing you could do right yes i mean i think just just achieving some basic level of awareness of 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 heritability and educational attainment um would would be useful as far as i'm aware people that are designing educational policies they they basically completely ignore genetics as yeah as an as an explanation so that's that's something I'm not sure, <laughs> like GWAS and genomic data. is. We've known this genetic component for many decades, and it's been ignored by, by people that design educational policies. So I'm not necessarily optimistic that, that anything is going to change yeah. in that respect. But, but um, mm-hmm. it's potentially a more powerful tool, having the genetic data. You can, you can study whether particular policies affect people differently depending on their genotype, for example. That's something social scientists who are into genetics, which the, there is a section of more forward-thinking social scientists that want to use genetics as a tool to study how policy affects people and uh, even as a tool to study like the environment. They're pretty excited about using genetics to, to, to aid assessment of policies, but that's a minority yeah. view probably still. It is a it is a minority view. I mean, that seems right. And do you think do you think that people have not been sort of outspoken enough? I mean, whenever I hear I see this stuff discussed in, um, uh, you know, just like a, a popular magazine or a newspaper, the people who want to uh, slow down or shut down the research, they're always sort of making these moral uh, appeals, these appeals to like the consequences. And, you know, I see a lot of people who just want to do the science and don't really talk about the consequences at all. They're just sort of avoiding the issue. Do you think that people who want to study things like uh, the, the heritability of cognitive ability, they should be uh, they should be sort of more open about, like, actually why this is important? We're not just doing it for fun and, like, granting to these other people that it actually it could be harmful. Well, yes, I think people can maybe sometimes be too defensive. Uh, it's almost like don't don't look over here. We're just going to do this quietly and and yeah. uh, carry on and hope hope we don't get cancelled. But uh, <laughs> but um, I agree. It is it is important. There's a reason it's 
controversial um, because it is important, right? Yeah. So I, I think it's it's a dangerous game making policy prescriptions so as a scientist. So I, I, I think maybe there's a case to be made that sometimes it should be done in certain areas, but I, I certainly don't want to get into the game of, of uh, advocating particular like school policies or something like that on the basis of genetics. But yeah, I, I do think people need to need to make the general public and, and the educated elite aware that it's, it's basically it's like it's like create, denying the heritability of education at this point. It's, it's kind of like a left wing view of creation a version of creationism. It's right. like we're going to ignore the, the biology and, and the evolution and everything that we know about genetics and, and just pretend we, we have a we can we can still believe in the blank slate and ignore everything that's happened over the past hundred years since it's not it's not really tenable. So I think people do need to argue against that, but there are potentially professional consequences for doing that. I mean, uh, I don't know if Paige Harden made made a lot of friends by writing that book, even if it was sort of a popular success. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure that many academics uh, came out and, and supported her writing of that book, even though I, I thought it was a good book. And uh, yeah. I, I know plenty of people that in private, say they they agree with a lot of what she said, but in public they don't want to come out and 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 support that kind of view. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Of course. I mean, I I don't think all geneticists necessarily or behavioral geneticists need to be out there saying, you know, I like this policy and I don't like that policy. Well, some of them might. I mean, some of them might have good ideas, uh, but yeah, just to be able to stand up and say, look, look, it matters. I mean, it's not it's not simply a. It's not simply um, we're not doing this just for fun. Like you have, this is an input you have to take in in whatever you know policy recommendations you end up uh, coming up with. Um, so, Alex, is there? Um, you know, I'll, I'll I'll let you go before I before I do. Is there any? Um, can you? Is there anything you're working on that you're excited about that you know you want to talk about uh, before before uh, before we're done? Sure, I could talk about my work on on genetic nurture and indirect effects because this is a good topic to prove that genetics is useful even if you're just actually interested in the family environment so one thing that i'm working on now is using multi-generation genetic models so i talked about the family thing where you just use the parents as controls essentially the genetics of the parents and that way you can try and understand whether the genes of the parents influence the offspring through the environment so that's that's a result that got a lot of attention back in 2018. It was work I was involved in in Iceland. So part of the genetic signal you pick up for educational attainment looks like it's actually being driven by the genes and the parents affecting the offspring through through the sort of environment that your parents provide for you. Mm. And um, I'm extending this to take again take advantage of randomization of genetic material from the grandparents to the parents. So you can essentially use it to do causal inference for an effect of parents on offspring. So this is a potentially powerful tool for social science, which has always struggled to estimate sort of causal effects of parenting because it's so confounded with genetics and everything. But this kind of a multi-generation genetic design can actually give you something like a causal estimate of parenting on off on offspring. So mm -hmm. that's that's a way that you can use genetics to actually access an effect of the family environment. And to have a really robust estimate of that that's not confounded with with other environmental factors or genetic factors. So that's why I would say don't don't shut down genetic studies of social science outcomes. It's actually a very powerful tool, even if what you're interested in is studying the environment. Is uh, so, but the so is there is does that mean that there's you think there's something wrong with the uh, adoption and twin studies that showed that. Uh, uh, parental um, influence wasn't all that high. So that's that's not actually true. For you have to be careful about what phenotype you're talking about there. So the phenotype that we originally studied for this genetic nurture thing coming from the parents is years of education. Right. So whether you go to, whether you go to college or not, there is actually it, the traditional twin studies do actually find a substantial shared environment component okay. around 30, yeah. 30 to forty percent. And they find a genetic component of like 40%. So the, the family environment component for whether you go to like college or not, that is actually substantial. Uh, yeah. When it comes to measuring something like IQ, generally they, they find the shared environmental component to not really be there in adulthood. They, they, 
they maybe see a bit of it in, in early childhood. So like around age yeah. up to like age 10 or something, you can see an influence of the family environment, yeah. but it seems, it seems to fade as people get older. So what I'm finding is not necessarily in contradiction to, to twin studies I see. Yeah. In, in, in this case. So the things that, the things that don't have much of a uh, parental component are intelligence and most personality. Right. And then things that do are education and well, what else? Is there anything else that's like education? Um, so I, again, I guess it depends which it, a lot of childhood phenotypes show a shared yeah. environmental component. Uh, I think things like, you know, your political preference or religiosity mm. also show a shared, shared environmental component. Maybe yeah. religiosity doesn't. I'm not sure. I think I, I think from the, I think from uh, I I studied this a little bit when I was in grad school. We had like a course on this and uh, or like a week on this, uh, uh, and it was like not political ideology that was genetic, but political party. Uh, so like whether you could consider yourself conservative <laughs> or liberal was just genetics, uh, not home environment. The party was actually home environment, which is interesting because the the, the correlation between those two is actually much stronger. Uh, as time goes on, so like there used to be a lot of conservatives who called themselves Democrats, for example. There's not a lot of that anymore. So I wonder, sort of, mm. if, if that's still true because that's that's changing now, uh, where you know conservatives tend to be Republicans and liberals tend to be Democrats. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, these things can change as well, right? Like depending. I mean, especially for these phenotypes, like political allegiance and political ideology. Like clearly, that that's somewhat contingent on our our, our current sort of social environment yeah 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 i saw i saw one study was like genetics of like foreign policy preferences and i said i was thinking that's too i think that's too <laughs> I mean, you've kept it, you're, you're not getting direct and most people don't think anything about foreign policy so you're you're catching something right it's like you're maybe you're catching sort of what tribe people go into and then the foreign policy correlates with that but yeah i, I wasn't <laughs> i wasn't impressed with that as sort of you know as a just a, a simple outcome variable um okay so Alex, it's been great having you on. Um, do you have a you have a Twitter? We'll we'll link to that. Is there anywhere else people can follow you, stay up to date with your work? Uh, no, just Twitter at the moment. Okay, sounds good. All right, thanks a lot, Alex. All right, thanks.